presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Let's go to uh, Andy in Boulder, Colorado. Hey, Andy, what's going on, brother? How much, Tom? How you been? I'm great, man. Yourself? Pretty good. Hey, congratulations on the grandbaby. Yes, thank you. I know. <laughs> he just said, Tommy just sent me a picture. I mean, it's gorgeous out right now. He just was taking him out for first walk this morning. All He's right. growling and prowling already. Yeah, I bet. Now, Tom O'Brien. What's going on, everyone? This is Jacob filling in for Tom today. He'll be back Tuesday. I'll be with you Monday as well. Uh, regarding the market, we have everything a little bit down. Um, Meta's up a little bit. NVIDIA's up a little bit. Um, the banks obviously were far higher this morning. We'll take a look at that. A little bit. Um, one of the things that was interesting is at the open, yeah, the ES Mini really pop up quite a bit. Um, give me a second here. And then we just had a complete just decrease in volume, or excuse me, decrease in uh, value here, uh, high volume on that bar down. It's been trying to get past that 4160 uh, for the past, uh, for the last uh, bit of the day. Um, so we'll see what happens. Light volume every time it's testing it. So We'll see if we get a little bit of a, a test again. Um, today, uh, we'll talk about the banks, which is huge. Um, I want to talk about a little bit. I, yesterday, I wanted to speak some on the, the hydrogen fuel cells that Toyota um, had been kind of developing and that broader market in general. Um, and we have a bunch of pretty interesting stuff to show you. Boeing, this is big news today. Uh, Boeing dropped about 5%, 5.7% in what went on with this is they had a uh, piece of their, their uh, 737 Maxes, um, and the company that they sourced it from was having production issues. That company is a Spirit Aero Systems. Uh, as you can see right here, uh, Spirit really, really took the dive today. Let's get it on a bigger time frame here. Going to yearly. So, I mean, just massive volume down. Um, there's a little piece in the back wing. It's not a uh, safety issue, Boeing is saying, um, but regardless, it's going to, there's some theory or some talk that it's going to hinder their production uh, numbers. So we'll see that comes uh, to fruition on that end. Um, however, Boeing is going with alternative suppliers. This is pretty bad um, for Spirit Aero Systems. Um, you know, when you're such a small company like this and, and your your major buyer is something like Boeing. When you fail, it's kind of hard to recover a little bit from that. Is, is this drop really meaningful in Boeing? You know, they're, they, they might meet production targets, right? If they're, if they're using other suppliers, there's a chance they'll meet the production uh, um, quotas that they have, uh, and it's not a safety issue. Um, this is a bit sad, because as you can kind of see from October of last year, you really had a lot of very attractive momentum building. I mean, you know, even the beginning of end of September, but of course, uh, on the 26th and 25th, you had this really nice volume here. So this was kind of a, it's kind of a shame for Boeing, but just, just if you hold this stock, just, just keep a lookout. I mean, I don't think this is going to really cut in too deeply. Um, so... We'll see what happens. Um, NVIDIA, interesting. Tesla, um, excuse me, Elon Musk bought a bunch of their GPUs um, because he wants to get into the AI business. And he had made <laughs> some conversation that, I think he wanted to buy uh, ChatGPT. Um, and they were or open AI, they're like, no, this guy is so spread thin. I, I, I don't understand how he has the capital for this. Um, I don't see what his long-term kind of solution for this is, or his long-term plan at least. I get so nervous every time he uh, says he's going to add some kind of new breadth to his, uh, uh, to his business. It's, it's just kind of strange. Um, we'll talk a little bit more on chips as well, especially with Intel. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about um, the OPEC cuts. And I spoke about this yesterday, right? 
and this is interesting, this is kind of going in fully to this recession talk, right? So IEA says risk oil supply deficits um, and threatens economic recovery. So definitely in the developing world and uh, countries that are not the US, this absolutely could be a major problem. Um, you're seeing this cut even reflect in Russian oil, which is now way, way, selling way above and being purchased way above by Asia, namely China, um, than, the, than the cap that the West had placed on it um, for sanction purposes. Um, so consumer countries represented by the IEA have argued that tightening supplies drive up prices, of course, and could threaten a recession, uh, while OPEC Plus blames Western monetary policy for market volatility and inflation, which undercuts the value of oil. Interesting. Um, oil market balances were already set to tighten in the second half of 2023, with the potential for substantial supply deficit to emerge. See, the IEA saw 2023 demand a record 101.9 million barrels per day, up 2 million barrels per day in the last year and on par with this prediction last month. And this kind of explains why this, uh, this sanction that the West has tried to place on Russia isn't, isn't really going to fly. Um, the IEA said it expected global oil supply to fall by 400,000 barrels per day by the end of the year setting an expected production increase of 1 million barrels per day from outside of the OPEC Plus, uh, beginning in March versus 1.4 million decline um, from the producer's block. So yesterday, what I was saying is I was looking at the CPI, and one of the major um, components that was pushing down the CPI was energy, right? And I was showing how there was um, a little bit of deployment from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves uh, done through March, and that uh, all these kind of revelations with increasing prices um, and lowering, um, it, mainly lowering supply came in April. We're gonna see a little bump in uh, uh, the United States. I think though, what I wasn't looking at yesterday when I was saying that we might get a far higher CPI afterwards is, you know, one, obviously we're gonna get the same amount that we were going to for the same price up until May. You have, some major analysts saying, I mean, even the Fed, saying that there's probably gonna be a recession. Recessions obviously drive down the price of oil because more people aren't moving around. It's not as in demand as it is when the economy is chugging along fine. Also in the same vein, you know, America um, has the, you know, we have the capacity to be the largest producer of oil if we aren't currently. I know it kind of flips sometimes, um, but you know, if anything really happens where it gets to a point where oil is getting way out of control, energy is getting way out of control, um, I do believe that uh, something like increased production uh, in the states will probably be a reality. Um, with the recession, again, I do see that being kind of a deflationary pressure uh, on the price of oil um, if this 400,000 cut um, does make some kind of a splash. Uh, folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you have any questions, ask me in the den, ask me in YouTube. You can call us as well. You can email me at jacob at tfnn.com. We'll be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30 plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. 
A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Welcome back, folks. So I got a uh, message um, from one of our viewers. He wanted to look at Fubo. So what Fubo is is a um, like a basically a live sports streaming platform. Um, I think this is somehow related with with YouTube TV. Um, I found some things that are I I don't really necessarily like about this. I mean, one, there's just no action here at all. You had a nice, real, steady decline. I mean, some kind of response in February of this year, but then, um, again, just a slow decline with not much volume whatsoever. I was looking at their financials. Uh, this company burns through cash uh, pretty quickly. Um, another thing that, uh, uh, his name is Barrett, the guy um, who asked about Fubo. Uh, he was saying that they've increased subscriber counts, and that is true, they have. Um, but what it seems uh, to be offset by is that uh, their, their price for acquiring content has also increased drastically. Uh, so much so that they, they had lower revenue, um, and it just seems like this company, at least currently, isn't really poised for anything big to blow. Um, that's just my opinion on it. Um, of course, always do your own research, um, but I don't know. When you, when you see kind of just a slow volume and, and nothing really being tested, um, I mean, the, the last high volume day isn't even close to being tested yet. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not a fan, at least of Fubo. Uh, it also turns out that they they only stream in 720p max. Not that's not great. Uh, that's really not great. And really, what is like their their leverage, right? Are are sports producers or are they going to just sign a straight contract with Fubo and that's it? Like, no, Fubo is very small. Um, I think someone else could easily step in and try to get um, some of that market share with there if they decided they want to. But that's my opinion on it, Barrett. Um, do with that what you want. Um, so what I wanted to look at as well was U.S. standing, uh, global standing in, in chip manufacturing. This is super interesting. There's been more talk uh, surrounding Intel with what's going on. And I'll give you a quick run on this, right? Um, so Intel had this light etch kind of uh, deal essentially to make integrated circuit chips, um, but this kind of complicated everything. Um, Intel executives believed it would take years for the method to become practical, and instead they stuck with older manufacturing techniques for the generation of chips. Obviously that's not uh, very good, um, especially if you 
you know, understand how Im important the newest cutting edge chips are. This is actually a way that we kind of kept China in the back is by uh, only giving them last generation chips. And you can see really a nice loss of, of share there uh, from the 90s, 2000s, and then projected out to 2030. Um, so it, the article says uh, Intel is today at another crucial juncture. If as planned, the company finally produces chips made with EUV, which is that etching strategy I was just talking about, uh, in large volume later this year, it will be an important step on the road back. And that's road back to any kind of dominance in that sector. Um, nowhere will progress be watched more anxiously, obviously, than in our nation's capital, um, where the current administration is facing an imminent decision about how much financial backing to throw behind the company. And really, they've, the current administration has pledged something like $52 billion in this. This is getting to a point where it's, you know, extraordinarily serious, especially on a national security level, um, to kind of keep these sensitive um, products, uh, you know, at least in, in our control. Uh, everything that's happening with Taiwan and the posturing going on there, you know, and even this, this projection here is quite nuts. I mean, this is straight cut in from China, taking away from Taiwan's production. Um, it's interesting. So yeah, last year, the U.S. Chips Act committed uh, $52 billion in direct subsidies to support semiconductor manufacturing and to boost research and development, along with an estimated $24 billion worth of tax credits over the next eight years. Uh, the law was designed to reverse a slide that has taken the U.S. share of chip production to 12% from 37% in 1990. It's another interesting, I, I do think like with situations we've had um, like the pandemic, um, and then what we are seeing now with some of these countries at least talk about not using the U.S. dollar for, for trade um, or, you know, whatever. Just, you, you know, you get this concept in, in economics called the Fisher effect. And, you know, if you're a basically developing country or a poorer country, the more you trade with a wealthier country, obviously the wealthier you become, the more advanced you become. And that's, I think, kind of what we're seeing is what the end goal of that is on a macro scale, where now these countries that were, you know, I mean, really developing with a capital D a few decades ago um, are now powerful enough to where they can make deals within themselves. And it does challenge a little bit of, of the U.S. hegemon. But one of the things that was interesting to me was during COVID, um, an article came out that uh, something like 90 percent, if not higher, of our pharmaceuticals were made outside of the country. And you know, I, I think these big situations are kind of turning a light on how serious that can be um, if everything kind of collapses and everything crumbles. And what I mean by everything collapsing is just international relations being shaken up, um, just any kind of tension on a global scale um, or something unforeseen like a pandemic. Uh, you know, it that poses a major, major issue. And so seeing this manufacturing coming back to the States as almost uh, a really, it's a valid security risk. It's not just a political opinion anymore. It's now being seen as this is necessary um, for any kind of uh, long-term survival, I would suppose. Um, you know, in AMD, it, every competitor for Intel has just basically smoked them for the past few years. Obviously, AMD is, is massive. Um, they've smoked everyone. NVIDIA is second in this. TSMC um, kind of split off from that same area. And uh, Intel just stays pretty, pretty standard in uh, the mediocrity, at least in this realm. Um, if they end up getting some nice capital injection uh, from the government based on this and that they can really get their stuff together on it, Intel could be po poised uh, to, to really make quite a, uh, a run-up on it. Um, so, yeah. They also are getting into Germany as well. This was a good article from Financial Times. Um, so Germany pushes Intel to spend more on the $17 billion chip plant. Um, officials will consider increasing subsidies for landmark project if the U.S. chip maker commits to greater investment. Uh, the U.S. Semiconductor Group is due to receive 6.8 billion euros in subsidies from Berlin to build a mega fabrication plant. Uh, in the eastern city of Magdeburg. Uh, people close to the company said Intel wanted subsidies to rise to at least 10 billion, citing higher energy and construction costs. 
German officials said they could increase the financial support, but only on the condition that the group invested more. However, any requirement for Intel to invest more could add financial pressure on the company at a critical time. And really, it is, I, I would like to see what the thought process is uh, on Intel's part for, for doing something like that. Again, I, I'll, I'll pull up this chart for you, um, but if you see how they're doing compared uh, to the competition, it, it just, it seems strange that they're asking for more if they could, in theory, do it with the amount that they're being offered. Uh, folks, when we go back, we'll continue a little bit more on this, not too much longer. I want to talk to you about something interesting with FINRA, and we're going to go into the banks as well. So, folks, we'll be right back. If you want to take advantage of this sector, now is the time to subscribe to my gold report. The Gold Report is a comprehensive look at the metal sector as well as the markets that move gold, which is the currency and bond markets. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Every Monday morning, I publish the Gold Report with coverage of gold, silver, bonds, the XAU, HUI, GDX, as well as more than 30 different mining equities. To see for yourself the types of profitable trades that are recommended within the Gold Report, sign up now by visiting TFNN.com. Don't miss out on the next great gold trade. Sign up today. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern for free. Each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TF. FNN.com. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. All right, folks. Yeah, so over the break, I wanted to show you this again since Intel is saying they need a little bit more from the German government in order to do what uh, they're manufacturing over there. This is. You know, this is what Intel has been doing. The share price is rebased in dollar terms. I mean, nobody is interested in it. You have this massive, I mean, this absolute monster of AMD. Even NVIDIA is kicking on TSMC. You know, kind of a similar at least movement, right? Like structure, but just way higher, uh, just, just meat-wise. So that's, you know, we'll see what they do. I, they, they should probably really go with what Germany is doing and, and figure out something along the way there. Um, all right, so the banks, the banks, the banks. Interesting reports. Uh, so JP, JP Morgan Chase reported a profit of 2.6 billion, a rise year over year from 8.3 billion. Wells Fargo's net income total close to 5 billion, a rise year over year 
uh, from $3.78 billion. Citigroup, very interesting. His net income is $4.6 billion, a rise year over year uh, from $4.3 billion. And then PNC, uh, net income of $1.68 billion, and that's up from $1.4 billion. Super interesting. Let's look at JPM quickly. Massive volume on the up there. Wells Fargo, just a little bit up as well. They have their own issues in the general sense. And then Bank of America up quite nicely. Let's take a look at Citi here as well. Huge bump up. A little bit more uh, um, reminiscent of what JPM did. This is interesting for a lot of reasons, okay? And so what I'll say is these guys are making good money based on the loans that they had, right? And increasing rates and whatnot. Um, Citibank is kind of in an interesting position because what they said forecast wise is they do expect clients to actually fall behind on payments in the coming quarter. And they say that the credit card delinquencies are rising, but they are below pre pandemic levels. So, you know, we're looking at this in the whole situation and, and, and in the geist of CPI and really inflation in general. And one of the things that Powell said is they might not have to raise rates, and this was a few, this was about a month ago, might not have to raise rates if the banks kind of reel in credit, okay? Right now, it looks like they're probably not going to do that. But with what Citibank is saying about expect more clients to fall behind on payments and credit card delinquencies rising, that might just restrict it on a, on a business level, right? So again, it's, it's hard to say what is gonna happen um, but one of the things that was interesting is um, Federal Reserve Governor Christopher Waller, um, what he brought up was that we are still way, way, way above that 2% mark. I mean, we're at 5% from last CPI. Um, so these rates, at least the levels they are currently, are going to stick. Um, but let me read you a little bit of what he said, because it is interesting. Um, he said, important measures of underlying inflation have, quote, basically moved sideways with no apparent downward movement. We were talking about that yesterday at this hour. Uh, Waller said in remarks, uh, economic output and employment are continuing to grow at a solid pace while inflation remains much too high. Um, and then he said that investors should not expect rates to fall anytime soon. He goes, monetary policy will need to remain tight for a substantial period of time and longer than markets anticipate. You know, that's... I mean, that's, that's certainly a powerful statement, right? Um, another thing that's interesting is just how much better these larger cap, these larger uh, capitalized, I suppose, um, banks are doing than the other ones, right? Your regional banks. And so obviously there's a lot of capital outflow into money market funds, uh, but even from the regional perspective, um, or if you're sticking in the bank perspective from the regionals into these larger uh, banks as well. And so um, I think we're going to continue to see this going up, uh, these guys, um, especially if the defaults aren't as bad as people initially thought they were going to be. Um, there is, I want to see this, this was interesting to me. So why move it in from the regionals to the larger? And it's not just because of the fear, um, or at least the fear is not just entirely unfounded. This was super interesting. This is the U.S. banks with the most uninsured deposits. And so this is a great little graph, and I want to look down here. Of course, you have the, the mother of all of them, Silicon Valley Bank, with 93.8% totally uninsured, uh, totaling assets at $209 billion. Uh, Bank of New York Mellon, 92%. State Street Bank and Trust, 91 Signature was at 89 Citibank, 73 Interesting. First Republic, our guy here uh, at 67. I mean, this is this is nuts to look at. I had not realized that it was this many. There, there's a uh, man. I forget what his name is. He he has a Greek name, and he's he's a Ford for an NBA team. But he has just tons of accounts with banks that are all <laughs> right at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It's pretty interesting, right? Smart guy. In case anything happens, he'll always be backed on that. Won't lose any of his money. Um, JP Morgan, you know, that's at just above 20 at 52% uninsured. 
So this is pretty nuts. And the Bank of America, our largest, you know, big one, 46.1 here. Um, so you can see there actually is a real risk, at least in an era where you just had like two major bank runs and the threats of other ones of, uh, you know, there's a major threat keeping your, your, your money in these kind of banks if they're uninsured like that. Um, it's interesting. Uh, let me see here. I want to talk a little bit more about Citibank because they were, they were exceptionally interesting today. Um, so this says the, uh, you know, higher incomes on the loans, share rise. They, they're also, their fixed income was far higher and they've been getting more money to pad anything in the event that something really bad goes on, um, which is super interesting. Their net interest income rose 23% to 13.3 billion. And then this is the interesting part. City also set aside 241 million to cover potential loan losses. It's very good. And that's up from 138 million a year earlier. And that's according uh, to the results reported Friday. Slowdown is likely to be mild and we're prepared, the CFO says. Um, they earned $1.86 per share in the first quarter, um, beating analysts' average estimates of 1.67. And they were up 2.8%. So, I mean, things are cooking regarding the bank stocks. Um, if the delinquencies aren't as bad and they're still... Some relative, I mean, credit card debt is increasing still. Um, who's to say that there actually is going to be a reeling in of, of cr the credit that's being currently deployed? I think that would be a hard thing to say, and I do think you're going to actually see a heavier hand on the Fed if that uh, is the case. Which would be, you know, just, just pretty strange. It's the return of the Mac, everyone. FTX is thinking about resuming... Uh, their exchange. I don't know who on earth would ever want to be in this at all. Let's see here. Let's do a quick overview with it. An April 12th hearing in the United States, uh, a April 12th hearing in the United States bankruptcy court. Uh, lawyers uh, representing FTX of the crypto firm have recovered roughly $7.3 billion in liquid assets. A March filing from the debtors reported the four FTX company silos had roughly $4.8 billion in scheduled assets as of November 2022 with an investigation into it. Um, thinking about resuming <laughs> sometime in the second quarter of 2024. I don't know about that. That's a, that's a pretty toxic name. I bring this up because the banks did something interesting also regarding crypto. Guys, stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Biotech is booming, but for how long? Whether you think the biotech bull has room to run or has run its course, trade LABU or LABD. Direction's daily S&P Biotech three times bull and bear ETFs. Visit directioninvestments.com slash biotech today. 
An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors, such as traders and active investors. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien. All right, folks, we are back. Uh, Eddie Odoms on YouTube asked, why is the VIX down today? Um, this week has been nuts. Yeah, the week has been nuts. I, I mean, you're right. There's just not a whole lot going on with it, and that is a little bit freaky, I would say. I, I you know, with everything I was just saying, how you have a lot of conflicting kind of things going on right now in the market, and now you're getting some talk that there's going to be a recession, but you're getting such strong job and, and, and wages holding, and, and banks are so strong right now, at least the bigger ones. Um, but then the same vein, like what Tommy just brought up and what I was talking about yesterday, so you have like seven companies who are driving this market entirely. If we look at... Uh, Give me a second here. Okay, I guess you did have a little bit more volume right now, like selling up in the Yes Mini, but uh, there's just, it doesn't seem like a whole lot's going on. And I don't know if they just don't know what necessarily to do or how to pose it. If there's low volume today, um, you know, on this close, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens, especially with the VIX being so low. Um, so I don't know. We'll see what happens with that. Why I brought up FTX in the crypto space beyond this just being insane that they're going to resume operations or thinking of it at some point um, is the banks have bought a lot of MicroStrategy. Give me a second. Which is insane. MicroStrategy is uh, Michael Saylor's. Michael Saylor, if you have a minute, you can look at his Twitter. I mean, it, it's, it's insane almost. All it is is just these strange... Uh, posts about Bitcoin, very cryptic. Uh, anyways, this is allowing the banks to get some pretty good exposure, and this just chart is, hold on, let me put it on a larger time frame. Oh, this is just insane, from March of last, uh, just of last March. I mean, look at this run-up. Let me see if I can get a, a monthly. I mean, it's just seriously such an impressive run-up. Um, this is basically the banks getting exposure um, to crypto, especially Bitcoin in particular. Um, I think there was some strategy uh, outlook that Bitcoin was going to outperform Ethereum. You know, who's to say? But uh, definitely the banks seem to be liking Bitcoin quite a bit since they're buying into uh, Michael uh, Saylor's uh, company here. MicroStrategy Incorporated is an American company that provides business intelligence, mobile software, and cloud-based services. Um, again, this run-up is not on... It's on somewhat significant volume. I don't know. I, I would not be a buyer at this point whatsoever. I think this is a little bit strange looking. Um, but it is interesting to know that this is how the banks are getting that exposure, especially with Bitcoin going up near like 31,000. Really, really impressive. And it blew when I pulled this chart up for the first time uh, just earlier because I had not looked at this chart yet. I, was, I laughed myself because I mean, this is insane. Last day with the volume you have is right here. It hasn't even, all the climb up has been on kind of low volume as well from this time. Last time you saw it was November 8th of last year when you had a lot of issues going on in the market um, and you just had a big, big red bar on high volume. So I don't know, just because the banks are buying it um, and it's so, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily 
be a buyer at this point, especially because it's so high off of March. I mean, what is this, January here? It's December. Take a look at like January 5th. I mean, look at that. I mean, 141, it's at almost 350 now, 335 up from 141 at the beginning of this year. That's a huge climb. Would not recommend buying at this moment. We'll see what happens with that. All right. Some shorter news, um, the, US, the cost to insure U.S. debt has been rising. This is pretty interesting. Um, there's all the issues going on right now in Congress about raising the debt ceiling. <laughs> and you had like a, a uh, congressman today saying, it's probably not that big of a deal if we just blow past it, which I don't know. You know, who, who honestly knows with that? But it is interesting to know that this is, this is a real tangible effect in the sense that the cost to insure the U.S. debt has, US debt has been rising. Um, this is, you know, some of the wage depression we've been seeing. Uh, this was an interesting article from QZ. Um, and this is for the lowest paid U.S. workers. This has fallen sharply. Wage growth for U.S. leisure and hospitality workers is slowing. In March, average hourly pay for those in production in non-supervisory roles grew 5.1% year over year, well below the record high of 17%. So they're still growing, but there's just a big, big deceleration in that growth. Um, you know, is that really what is going to matter on inflation when we talk about wage suppression? Suppression? Not sure, honestly. Those leisure and hospitality workers now make an average of $18.51 an hour, 24% increase from 1490. That's pretty stellar. Um, just some interesting short news with that. Um, again, also, you know, I was talking yesterday on the cannabis stocks, and don't be fooled by these headlines here. You know, this is, it seems like it'd be a bullish headline. Retail sales to surpass 33.5 billion, topping chocolate, eggs, and craft beer. One of the things to really, again, not to mention how expensive the labor is and how much goes into that. But also these companies just get so taxed. There's so much money that moves through these companies and there's so little that comes out of it. Again, not a big buyer in it currently, but that was brought to my attention earlier um, and I thought that was a little bit interesting. So in the realm of hydrogen, someone was asking me, I think it might've been Pat Stone or, or Peter from Park City in, in YouTube, um, maybe a few weeks ago about hydrogen cells that Toyota was working on. This is super interesting. They've come out, they've developed a new, basically how you get hydrogen, right, uh, for, that would be used in fuel cells or just in general, is mainly through electrolysis. And that's gonna be sending electrical currents through water and you're gonna rip apart uh, your molecules essentially. They found a more efficient way to do this. Um, and it's using uh, basically photovoltaic cells um, and they're cooling these photo photovoltaic cells with the streams um, from the electrolysis. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty interesting. So they're fueling, fueling the electrolysis from it, and it's then cooling what is fueling the electrolysis. Pretty interesting. But what was also brought to my attention in the same realm is this introduction of synthetic petroleum that Porsche has been doing. It's super cool. It's very energy dense. Um, and having that in between from you know, your, the fossil fuels that we use now into a world where EV is the dominant um, source of power for cars. Uh, I found this really interesting. And of course, it's a recipe uh, from German scientists in the 1920s. Of course it is. It's called, uh, it's called synth gas. And it's like a mix of methane and uh, carbon dioxide. It makes a super, super dense, um, very energy, you know, there's a lot of potential energy in it. Um, and so Porsche is going to start creating more and more of it. And uh, it says the e-fuels can act like gasoline, allowing vehicle owners a more environmentally friendly way to drive. Doing this in Chile. Uh, e-fuels are a type of synthetic methanol uh, produced by a complex process using water, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide. Excuse me, methanol, not methane. Companies say they enable the nearly... CO2 neutral operation of gas powered engines. Very interesting. Vehicles will still need to use oil to lubricate the engine. All right, not a super big deal, especially when you're talking about lower CO2 emissions. The Chilean plant was initially announced with Porsche in late 2020, but invest two, 24 million <laughs> into development. Folks, stay tuned. We'll be right back. We'll talk a little bit more on that in some interesting 
uh, developments in cancer uh, research. Situ. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. All right, so this is some super cool news. This comes from some guys at Stanford. This is an MIT technology report. Uh, but this is using modified microbes to basically chew through cancer cells. They've done it in mice. They're about to do it in humans. The team started the investigation by choosing a microbe that is commonly found on human skin, and that is S. epidermidis. And it's thought to be a member of the human microbiome, and it doesn't typically cause disease. The microbes the researchers used were originally collect collected from behind a human ear. Uh, the researchers modified these microbes by inserting a new gene into them. The gene code for a protein that sits on the surface of some cancer cells. Interesting. The idea is that if the immune system generates cells that recognize the microbe, these cells will also recognize tumors. The team then applied these, quote, designer bugs to mice by wiping them over the heads of the animals with a cotton bud. Another group of mice had the regular unmodified samples of bacteria smeared onto them. In both cases, the microbes quickly made a home for themselves on the mice's skin. That's a nice thing to think about, isn't it? Over the following days and weeks, these cancer cells grew into tumors, and the mice had been given, uh, that had been given the regular microbe, but the progression of the cancer was significantly slowed in mice that had been given the engineered microbe. You could see these huge tumors growing on the side of the mice that had been swabbed with normal bacteria, uh, but you couldn't see anything in the mice that had been given the modified microbes. 
He points out that this particular type of cancer is notoriously aggressive and more difficult to treat in mice. So this is pretty awesome. Now, I'm not super big into uh, any of these kind of like biotech stocks or anything, and I'm, this obviously isn't, this is just in uh, university research currently, but what, what a big, big uh, development. And if this does the same in humans, um, we could see some pretty interesting stuff. Just to quickly wrap up the day, something that was interesting is a Birkin bag uh, maker, which is Hermes, sees no US slow, these are designer bags, no US slowdown. And sales jumped 23% for the first quarter. That is pretty insane, especially since we just saw uh, with um, the consumer sentiment that people on the higher end of the uh, income uh, kind of scale are kind of decreasing their consumer sentiments. It's interesting to see what will happen in quarter two. Folks, have a lovely weekend. I will see you Monday.